It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program uh, Professor Emeritus of Economics at University of Massachusetts Amherst, now visiting professor at the New School, the founder of Democracy at Work and the host of Economic Update, Richard D. Wolf. Uh, welcome uh, back to the program, Richard. Thank you, Sam. Glad to be here. And I have to say, you know, um, there I, 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 w- we've done now of, of this iteration of the show about almost 2,000 episodes. And so I've forgotten a lot of people who are on. But some people I feel like, oh, we just had them on like six months ago. And so I want to apologize. It's been almost six years <laughs> and since we've had you on. And I, I, I literally have been saying, like, oh, we, you know, we had them on like six months ago. Um, and uh, so uh, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, today. My pleasure. Uh, I was going to start with a with a question about Stormy Daniels, but I'm going to put that for the back bo- back burner. <laughs> okay. It's not my expertise. <laughs> All right, fair enough. All right, well, let's go right towards uh, your expertise. Um, give us give us an overview of 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 where we're at in terms of. I mean, we spoke six years ago. We were closer to the wake of the financial uh, crisis. Uh, there was an emerging uh, movement uh, out of Occupy Wall Street. Where, and, and really, I mean, give us a sense of where you think we are in terms of people's acceptance of, of, of Marxist thought, of socialism, broadly speaking, relative to even, let's say, you know, uh, eight or ten years ago. Well, I'd be glad to. Um, and it's easy. Uh, it's a new world. It's a uh, quantum leap from what was to what is. Let me explain. Most of my life growing up here in the United States, uh, I was born in Ohio and I've lived all my life and worked all my life here in America. Um, I lived through what now is called the Cold War. That is, I came of age at a time when the big bad enemy was uh, the Soviet Union and anything and everything having to do with communism, socialism, Uh, you name it, uh, was evil and bad and something you should stay as far away from as you possibly could uh, in every way. If it ever came near you, go the other way and so forth. Now, uh, and particularly this is true since 2010, I would say, um, all of that has changed. In a sense, the Soviet Union is obviously gone as as a political entity, But much more important than that, it's that this capitalist system that touted itself to all of us as the greatest thing since sliced bread clearly isn't. Uh, The crash of 2008 brought that home to everybody uh, except the most diehard who don't want to face what's going on. And when we spoke six years ago, we were in the early phases of coping with what this capitalist crash meant, now, six years later, uh, we can see in its full form that this is a system that, uh, capitalism I mean now, that is simply not working very well for the vast majority of people. And we can see it, if we're willing to look at it, almost anywhere. But the place I'd start is in politics, where all of the old political conventions the old political parties, the old political type of candidates, the old set of political assumptions, all of those are gone. We are in a new world in which the old parties are uh, increasingly being voted out of office. That's what happened in Greece. That's what happened in Italy last weekend. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the end of all of that. We're confronted first with an unthinkable new politics in an African-American president, Obama, followed by, in a different way, an unthinkable politician on the extreme right, Mr. Trump. And we kind of see the spinning out of control of a society that is struggling, even with much denial, with the fact that the economic system it assumed would last forever is in very deep trouble. And so I think the openness, the interest in alternatives, socialist, and even others that are, don't have those convenient labels, is on a, on a high. And I can tell you from my own experience running around the country giving talks, um, the weekly radio and TV program I now do, that 
that the interest is like nothing I had seen in the 40 years before uh, 2010. All right. So, 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 with that said, and the um, uh, the manifestation of the failure of capitalism to satisfy a, a the broad base of people in the country, um, uh, what you know, what is uh, what's the next step? I mean, you know, today in the Washington Post, uh, Elizabeth Bronig and I, you know, I, I, maybe maybe there has been a a um, a. a, 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 a you know, a columnist who's written a uh, a piece like this, but you know, I I don't recall it, and I'm you know I'm 50 years old. I don't recall okay. reading something like this in the the Washington Post in a national paper. It's time to give socialism a try. Um, I mean, what? I mean, that's pretty uh, that's pretty astounding. And and you may might have a better right. sense of that than uh, than than I. But so, what is what's the next step here? I mean, is it still identifying uh, capitalism? And the uh, the 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 nature of our capitalism as the problem, and what what do you say f- to people who say, well, okay, capitalism is not inherently broken. It is just that um, the reforms that we place upon it uh, have been um, have been damaged. I, I I'm afraid I'm one of those who says it's uh, the system is busted. It's been broken for a while. We've papered it over with a mixture of uh, scotch tape and rubber bands and a lot of denial of what's going on. And those those excuses, if you like, those short term palliatives just are not working. I mean, let me again explain briefly. Starting in the 1970s, we had three basic phenomena that changed our economic system. Number one, uh, corporations were sick and tired, capitalist corporations, of paying the high wages that had been pushed and forced out of them by the labor movement and by the left, particularly after the crash of the 1930s. They had always been disgusted by that, but they hadn't been able to do much about it since they were stuck here. Uh, The world had changed and they now became unstuck. What do I mean? They were able to bring much lower-waged workers into the United States. That's immigration. They were able, because of the Internet and jet travel, to move their production out of the United States to capture lower-wage workers in other parts of the world. And with the invention of the uh, computer, they were able to use computer, robotics, and now artificial intelligence to replace vast numbers of workers with cheaper machines. And the end result of those three events was that the rising wages of the American working class, which had been a feature of America for 150 years, was over. It was over in the 1970s. It has never returned since. Uh, The fact that we teach our students uh, what we call the real wage, what you get paid, adjusted for the prices you have to pay. The real average wage in the United States today is the same thing it was in the late 1970s. All of the increase in wages has been offset by the rising prices, leaving you no better off. The American working class has been really cut off at the knees, and the society has spent itself in the last 30 to 40 years denying what I just said, even though the statistics are there for everyone to see, and covering it over. The biggest single palliative, credit. Making everything that we do, whether it's a bottle of water we buy at the corner store, uh, on over to the education for our kids, is now paid for by borrowing money because we can't afford to do it any other way. And it doesn't take a genius to understand that the time will come when the rising debts you collect can't be handled by the wages that are not going up. And that's what happened in 2008. And so people now understand that this capitalist system that ran us through these last 30 or 40 years is literally exhausted. And I think all over the world, people are beginning to ask, gee, what about that socialism that we bad-mouthed so long? Is there something there that could solve the problem uh, that we have? And it's not just a a columnist in the Washington Post. The the polls show, for example, today in Great Britain 
that the, 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 if there were an election today, the, the party that would win is the Labour Party, and the new leader would be Jeremy Corbyn. Right. He describes himself as a socialist. He's sort of the Bernie Sanders, if you like, of that country. And they're not that different from us. So, yeah, I think Americans are in the process uh, of reevaluating all of their thoughts about these subjects. I would caution that because we as a nation have not paid attention to what socialism is other than to badmouth it for 50 years, we are not yet aware, This is we're just beginning to understand that what socialism means to people has changed over the last 50 years. We're kind of behind the ball. For many socialists today, for example, it has nothing to do with giving the government a greater role, which is what a lot of people think if you haven't paid attention for 50 years. For example, today in the world, more people think of socialism as going from a top-down hierarchical company to a worker co-op type of company, making the production of goods and services something that really is democratically owned and operated by the collection of workers who, who go there and the collection of customers who use it. That kind of a notion of socialism, which a lot of people don't even at attach the word to, is actually what is the ascendant idea of a socialist alternative. Well, Americans are going to have to learn that before they can even debate the pros and cons.